Well, good morning. If we've never met before, my name is Tyler. I'm one of the lead pastors here. I lead alongside of my amazing wife, Lee. We're glad that you are with us. We're continuing this series on the early church. We will look at the book of Acts and we investigate what can we learn from the birth of the church and what is it that we need to reflect and even go back to. Before we even dig into this passage, I want us to pray. God, in this moment, we want you, I want you, I want you to be the one that speaks, you to be the one that, that empowers these words to impact people. God, I pray that you would maybe quiet some of the things that we bring in so that we can hear your still small voice. But God, if, if there's people in the room, and I know there are, that are walking in with heaviness and burdens and baggage, God, would you remind us in these next few moments, in this day, in this week, that you actually want those things from us? That you're not wanting us to pretend like everything is good when it is not? You're not asking us to come to you with this version of ourself that we think is adequate and worthy of love. You ask us to come as we are and experience your tremendous and scandalous grace. God, this morning we give all that we have to you. We want to meet with you. Holy Spirit, come. Have your way. Amen. Today I want to spend some time in Acts 9, 1 to 19. So you can grab your Bibles if you have them and turn to Acts 9. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And so... Uh, if you have your app on your phone, you're welcome to use that, or the, the, the Bible verses, the scripture will be on the screen. It's important that you know that Acts and Luke are like, are like two parts of the same book, written by Luke. We have Luke and then a continuation in Acts. And so Luke is the author who is unpacking what happens in the church as a result of Jesus. And in this passage of Acts, we find Saul. Now, Saul later becomes Paul, which creates some conflict for me just practically as a human being because even as I was writing out and working on my sermon, I kept going Paul and then fixing it to Saul and then going back and writing Saul or Paul. And so just full disclosure, I am a human being. I am far from perfect clearly. And so if I say Paul, I mean Saul. And if I say Saul, I mean Saul, Paul, Saul, Saul, Paul, same guy. Okay? Same guy. Give me some grace. I had to keep correcting it in here. And so we're looking at Saul who then becomes Paul. And I want us as we're exploring this because we're going to find Saul as the center part of this section and then next week and then we're gonna see a lot of him as Acts progresses. I want us to understand who Saul is, not who we understand and know Paul to be, but who Saul is. Because I think that it makes this historical, biblical account especially powerful. In a previous week, I talked about Stephen, the first martyr who lost his life by stoning. And I just imagine how horrible that would be. It's important that you know, Luke makes sure that we're clear that when Stephen was murdered for his faith, Saul was there. Saul agreed with the killing completely. And in Acts 8, verse 3, we find that Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. Okay, so even before we get to Acts 9, we're beginning to see a little bit of a picture of who Saul is. Agreed completely with the stoning of an innocent man, and then he's going everywhere to, what, destroy the church. And so in Acts 9, verse 1, Luke tells us this. He says this. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. Now just think about the beginning of this verse for a, a moment. Saul was uttering threats with every single breath. 
consistently and constantly uttering threats. He was eager to kill the Lord's followers. This is not a passive view. This is not a, I'm annoyed by them. He wanted to kill them. This evidence is where his heart was at and who he was. And if you aren't familiar, I, I do want you to know that there are places in the world right now where following Jesus could actually cost you your life. The early church was facing this, where if they followed Jesus, they could die. There are still places right now in 2024 that if you follow Jesus, you risk your very life. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment if you lived in one of those places, or if you were familiar with the leaders of the movements of the people that would kill Christians. If you are familiar with those people with the leaders that were instrumental in hunting down and killing Christians, if that person, that leader walked in the room or was in your community, you would be understandably nervous. You would be looking and going, I know what that guy has done. I, I know what that means and, and immediately start to build some things in your mind. You would be understandably on edge. Now, this would have been similar to the view that the early church had of Saul. Saul was not someone that early Christians would have been excited about seeing. Because in, in non-conceptual terms, in actual terms, if we saw Saul, death may follow him. And so there would be this weight in interaction and, and understanding who Saul is. And Saul is going around and he's uttering threats and he was eager to kill Jesus' followers. And it says that he went to the high priest. And in verse two, he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. And so we find that Saul isn't content to just breathe out threats. He's not just breathing out threats of violence. Instead, he was looking to the religious leaders to give permission and cooperation to arrest followers of the way. Now, this language is valuable and important. I talked about it in previous weeks. Early Christians weren't called Christians. They were actually called followers of the way. And I think this language is beautiful. Because when you think about a follower of a way, it's not just a set of beliefs that you arrive at at some point and then just park and go, at least I got into heaven and I'm good. Followers of the way denote a people that go and turn from the way of the world and instead embrace the way of Jesus in every single area of their life. It's a far more active pursuit than simply at one point saying, you know what, I think I'm interested in this and maybe I'll show up every once in a while at the church. Followers of the way. It, it has this like beautiful ring to it too where you can just imagine the Israelites and, and the Romans and some of the people going, is he a follower of the way? It has a, an, an, a, a beautiful way of kind of skirting some of the baggage that even we have or that people around us have around Jesus. Followers of the way. And Saul is committed to seeking out followers of the way of Jesus to take them back to Jerusalem in chains. It even, it says that men and women, like he didn't care, men, women, put them in chains and take them back to Jerusalem. And in Acts 9 verse 3, we learn that this was something he was taking very seriously. It says as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, this was a mission for him. This was not something that he was viewing as insignificant. He was on a mission. And as he was on this mission, on the way to Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. In verse seven, 
the men with Saul stood speechless. For they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. And so his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Here you have this moment. Saul's on a mission. Jesus meets with him on the road to Damascus. It's helpful for us to understand what this trip would have been like because I think in our mind, if we don't have kind of an idea of geography, we're like, I don't know, it could have been 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. This was a 200 and roughly, just a little over 240 kilometer trek that he's walking. 240 kilometers, not exactly a short trip. It would have taken approximately a week. A week of walking. Now, I don't know what you're like if you go for walks. I have found walking to be really restorative for me. But one of the things that I notice is that as I'm walking, as I'm engaged with my body just in rhythm and stride, my brain is able to process. My, my body is preoccupied with just moving and my brain can take things and work them over and consider them. And when we walk, we're often present with our thoughts. So imagine... Saul, who is committed to taking out Jesus' followers, followers of the way, and he has a week of ruminating and thinking and imagining what he's going to do. Now, now I'm guessing on some of that, but I just imagine that path as he's thinking about it and maybe in fantasizing on all the things that he's going to do as he, as he seeks out justice. He's going to crush this movement, because it's really important for you to understand that Saul thinks he's doing the right thing here. He thinks that he is calling out heretical beliefs, that he is standing on the, on the face of truth, that he is doing something right, but he was deceived, and he had been walking, stewing in that deception, and then Jesus, rich in mercy, showed him a different way, met him where he was. So he's on this journey to Damascus, and all at once, light begins to shine all around him, like this overwhelming brightness of light. And understandably, then he falls to the ground. And then he heard the audible voice of Jesus, who said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, Jesus is unpacking something important, certainly in in terms of even our understanding. He's reminding Saul and us that, that when people persecute followers of Jesus, that they are persecuting Jesus himself. There's that incarnational sense that he actually, he bears this with us, that we are one grafted together. And so he's saying, why are you persecuting me? And Saul responds, who are you, Lord? Now, I don't know how he said it. It was like, who are you, Lord? But he, he's trying to make sense of what happened. Now, I, I initially, I'm reading this going, who are you, Lord? Like, does he already understand that Jesus is who he says he is? And the scholars would say, no, that in that scenario, that this was, this was a sense of a, a title of awe or respect. So he's going, who are you, Lord? As if to say, Whoa, and I'm gonna treat what just is happening with a level of awe and respect, which you can understand. If you're in a scenario where you're out for a walk on a mission and you see light that blinds you and you hear the audible voice of someone who is controlling it, you're understandably going to be in this place of awe and respect. And so he says, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what to do. And here we learn that Saul wasn't by himself. It says that the men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the voice or the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. And Saul picked himself up off the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. 
So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. So Saul has heard Jesus. And it's fascinating that his companions also heard Jesus, but they didn't see anyone. So interesting, he's blinded, Saul is blinded, so he can't see, and his companions can't see where the voice is coming from either. Paul had, or Saul has been blinded in this, and, and we find this story and you think, it's a pretty wild experience to have. Like, you can imagine if this was you and this happened to you, it would definitely shake up some preconceived notions. So if you're Saul and you have made it your mission, thinking, I'm standing on the right side of justice here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take out these, these followers of the way, and then you go and you experience this where Jesus makes it so clear that what you are doing is harming him and he also demonstrates unbelievable power over you, you would, you would get to this place of going, is it possible that I was wrong? You know, like I often think about how stubborn we are or maybe how stubborn I am. And I think about the depths and ways that God, how far God will go to just, demonstrate to us, you know what? You're wrong. And so what he does for Saul is is he does something unbelievably miraculous to get his attention. And and it's a really beautiful story, but I, I was most captured, honestly, by reflecting on the next part. All of this is happening to Saul, and then in verse 10, we find a shift. It says in verse 10, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. That's where Saul is heading to, Damascus. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. And he responds, yes, Lord. And in this case, he knew exactly who he was talking to. This was not awe or respect. He knew this was God. He knew that this was Jesus. And the Lord said, go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. And I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Now consider this for a moment. For Ananias... You're Ananias, and God is speaking directly to you. Wow, that's amazing. I don't know what your experience has been like. I've never heard the audible voice of God. Ananias is hearing God very, very, very clearly. I haven't experienced it. I would like to. I I would love to hear God speaking. But I want us to consider the scenario that God is actually speaking out loud here. Consider the weight of what God is saying because there is a real reality that that I think we need to wrestle with of going, if if I wanna hear the audible voice of God, am I willing to hear what he's about to say? Because notice what he's not doing. He's not going, hello, Ananias. I just want you to know I love you, I'm proud of you, and you're great. No, what does he say? He's saying words that could cost Ananias' life. He's asking Ananias to do something that will confront every bit of comfort in himself. And I think there's a piece for us that should carry some level of weight of recognizing that if we want God to speak, recognizing that there are times that when he does, it will cost us everything. And it will be uncomfortable. And that's beautiful. There's this weight of what God needed to say to Ananias and the necessity of actually saying it so clearly to Ananias. And so he doesn't, he, he, he's talking to Ananias and he's saying, listen, uh, the church knows who Saul is. Ananias immediately, he would have been tracking. This is what I just pictured. He He's listening to God and God's saying this stuff and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, Saul. And Ananias is like, oh no. Like I know who that is. 
And he's not just saying, go and seek him out. In that, you're like, oh man, that would, the pit in your stomach. Like, listen, I want the audible voice of God. I'm not sure I want him calling me to something like that. And then he's not just saying you need to go seek him out. He's actually saying, go lay hands on him. Like, get close. Like, there's a degree that you play the game of going like, if God went, I just need you to observe him from afar. You're like, I got it, got it. You're like, He's like, go over to him. You're like, I don't want to. Which makes complete sense why he responded next with, but Lord. And notice it says, exclaimed Ananias. So I think he's like, but Lord. Maybe with like a voice crack, but Lord. Ugh. And he says, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Like Ananias knows exactly what God's asking him to do and he he understands the significance of this. And I think even in this, even in this is a, a beautiful representation of what it looks like to actually have conversations with God. I think in our minds, we think we need to come with some sort of like a polished version of I'm gonna tell God the things that I think he wants to hear and God's going, I actually really want you. And you're like, no. And so we find in an eyes, he's honest here. He's like, listen, I know who this guy is. I know the terrible things that he has done. And beyond that, he has power. He has positional power to do things, to arrest me. And so Ananias expresses that to God. And God doesn't belittle his lack of faith. He doesn't look and go, oh, Ananias, You terrible, terrible follower of the way of Jesus. Instead, he just calls him again to go. But then he attaches a why. He says in the next verse, in verse 15, the Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. There are moments that God asks us to do things. And our question is, why? And and I'd love to tell you that every single time that we ask that question, that God goes, let me tell you. Like in this, for Saul is my chosen instrument. And you go, "I, I would like that clarity all of the time. And yet in this scenario, we see the weight and gravity of the situation. And so God is very, very clear with Ananias. Now, I just want you in all of this to imagine the internal dialogue and the push and pull that Ananias is feeling. Like, on one hand, he's like, wow, God is speaking. And on the other hand, he's like, I don't want to do what he's asking me to do. He's like, I I know who this guy is. He's pulling men and women out of their houses, jailing them, murdering people. Like, this, this is a big deal. And then he's hearing, wait. So God's saying he's going to use this man as a chosen instrument to take his message to the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, to the kings, as well as to the people of Israel. It's a big deal. And we find in the next verse something really interesting where God goes even further. He explains what Saul is about to do, but he explains the cost to Ananias. And I wonder if there was just a little bit of Ananias is going, okay, he's with us. Because this could cost him everything. It says in verse 60, 16, God's speaking and he says, and I will show him, Saul, how much he must suffer for not my name's sake. Again, we have this this beautiful vision of God speaking to us and and sometimes the reminder that as he speaks to us that it may actually require us to suffer and experience difficulty. And it conflicts with some things in our minds because we go, well, I thought following Jesus meant everything gets easier. Who told you that? Because I think if we look at the biblical accounts, we will not find that. And yet, in our cultural moment, we find, well, it should all be up and to the right. There's a cost. And it's really important for us as Jesus followers to actually count the cost. 
and actually communicate with each other that there is a cost to actually following Jesus. If we're comparing the way of the world and the way of Jesus, it tells us that we must give something up. That is the way of the world. And, and there's a real reality that following Jesus will cost us everything, our very life. And then it begs the question, is the cost worth it? And I believe with all of my heart that anything that I'm giving up it is, is so small and insignificant to everything that God gives me. But I also think that there's moments for us to reflect and going, this is going to cost me. I think when we just become really comfortable being Sunday Christians or, or just as a ticket into heaven, we, we kind of go, okay, I'm okay with following Jesus as long as he doesn't step in my life into certain areas that I have said and no and out of bounds to. I'm okay with following Jesus if it means I go to church every once in a while. Not if it challenges me too much, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay if I can fit him into my busy schedule. And what Jesus comes to offer us is he comes to be Lord of our entire life, upending everything, transforming every single part of us. And so as Jesus followers, the reality is, is that we, when we begin to follow him, we can't fully understand all that it will cost us. We'll learn that over time, but there is a degree that we have to at least come to terms with that actually following Jesus costs us. It costs us our comfort. It costs us our coping strategies. Like some of us, we, we go, I, I'm trusting in God and my 17 hours of worrying every single week. Or I'm trusting in God and also my anger that guards this broken heart heart. We have all sorts of things that we go, I want Jesus. And some of these other things, if you could just, I don't really want you to confront that. There's a philosopher and theologian named Dallas Willard that, that says that there's no problem that we have as human beings that apprenticeship to Jesus can't solve. Now, that creates some tension for many of us because you're like, well, are you just saying it's only Jesus? And I go, well, the more and more that you conform your life to the way of Jesus, the more and more that you experience the kind of life that you were made for. But it requires us at some level identifying there are some areas that are difficult for me. There's some places that I'm not sure. I, I'm willing to trust God, but I, I kind of want to hold on to my money. I'm willing to trust God, but I kind of want to do whatever I want with my life. And so God is saying to Ananias, reminding him of something that he would have already known, that there is a cost. Now, he's connecting it to what Paul is about to do. And it's almost like in direct connection to the scale of what Saul is about to do is the degree that he will suffer. And again, like we go, I want to do big things. God, I want to do big things for you. And he goes, count the cost first, please. Because the, the consequence of that, if we look at Scripture, is we see that there is a substantial amount that we must endure in order for us to go and be who God asks us to be. And I, and I, I want you to know it's worth every little bit of it. But I don't want to be dishonest and go, oh, no, it's great. It's easy. It's just better. And so Ananias is invited to step out here and risk something. In fact, risk everything. But he knew that there was a cost to him, and there was also a cost to Saul's future. He understood that there was a lot at stake. He understood the, the stakes were high. And so Ananias went and he found Saul, and he laid his hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't want us to miss even just this, that, that he actually calls Saul Brother Saul. He's talking to God, and he's like, you know what this guy has done? You know all the things that he's doing? And then by the time he goes to him, he's laying, and he goes, Brother Saul, like, welcome to the family. And I just imagine the stuff in that. Like if you're looking at Saul and you're part of the early church and you were there when Stephen was murdered and you're like, brother, Saul, 
how transformed must you be by the forgiveness of Jesus in order to extend that same level of forgiveness to others? The past is gone, and the new life is here. Ananias had a mission. He laid hands on Saul for his eyesight to be restored and for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 18, instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and he was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Now, I do wanna just, as an aside, just talk very briefly about baptism. I want you to notice what happens here. Saul meets with Jesus. Ananias prays for him. He experiences healing. He gets filled with the Holy Spirit, gets baptized. There's this pattern that we find in Scripture, if we're looking, that we find people believe and be baptized. And and I know that there's all sorts of things in our head that for some of us, we're like, I don't know if I want to get in front of people. I don't have all the right answers. Maybe I'll get to a point that I go, now I'm ready. And I do want to just let you know, if you follow the way of Jesus and have not been baptized, we would love to encourage you to take that step. Be baptized. And again, Lee and I would love to talk with you through what that actually looks like and means, but we want to be the kind of community that that takes that seriously. We celebrate that in our church. And so we don't have another baptism on the schedule, but I would love to put one. And so if there are people in the room or watching afterwards that go, I need to be baptized, fill out a connect card and let us know. You'll always have all sorts of excuses that you make. Nobody... Nobody is looking to get dunked in front of a bunch of people as their ideal way to spend a Sunday morning, and yet it is the, one of the most beautiful and transformative parts of us as a church community. For us to celebrate that is substantial. And, and what happens when we baptize someone is similar to what we even see here with Saul and Ananias. It, it's a reminder of this is why we do what we do. This is why our time and our sacrifice and at times our risk is worth it. It's evidence of that impact for for us as a church family. So Ananias has stepped out, risked something for Saul, and as a result of it, Saul gets baptized. Ananias steps out in faith. He prays for Saul. His eyesight is restored, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And Saul goes on to become Paul the man who wrote the majority of the New Testament, letters to churches he started. He planted churches and advanced the church in a way that brought us to here today. The church exploded because of Saul, who became Paul, who surrendered to God's leading, because of Ananias, who said yes, when it could cost them everything. It's so beautiful when you think about what what Paul eventually does when we consider Saul's life. And so was it worth the risk for Ananias? Absolutely. But I I want us for a moment to, to think, before we think more about Ananias, to consider even the transformation in Saul's life, the the beauty that we find here. I I was reading something in one of the commentaries that I thought was really interesting. In, In the beginning of the passage that I read, Luke is telling us, in the beginning of this chapter, that Saul was uttering threats with every breath. So hold in tension your idea around transformation and all that he did in Saul's life. And at the beginning, Luke is telling us that he was uttering threats with every single breath. Now here we actually find allusion to the the imagery of a wild beast. The, The word that's used here is actually referenced in Psalm 80. There's an interconnection, and it speaks to this idea of a wild boar in a vineyard. Wild boar just in, just ripping everything apart. And that is what Saul was. That's how Saul is being described. Now, even this, even this is a powerful image for us. Because we begin to think, oh, that's who Saul is, like a wild boar ripping apart the vineyard. And 
And if you're familiar with biblical language, there's a lot in there around us as part of the, the, the vine, grafted into the community, bearing fruit. And so Saul's in there ripping it apart. He is a wild beast. But then the language goes even further where it is talking about someone whose heart is cruel and sadistic. Okay, so this is who Saul is. This is what is in Saul. And so as I, I was reading, there was a quote by John Calvin that I thought was so fascinating. So you think about this wild beast, this boar, this, this person who's trying to harm and, and hurt everything. And Calvin says this, God's grace is seen not only in such a cruel wolf being turned into a sheep but also in his assuming the character of a shepherd. So he's destructive, like a wild boar in a vineyard. He's like a wolf killing the sheep. And God's grace turns the wolf into a sheep who becomes a shepherd. It's the reminder for us of God's immense and powerful grace. From a wolf to a shepherd. From someone like a boar destroying the vineyard to someone building it. Complete transformation that lasts. Saul goes from being someone that persecutes Christians to leading Christians who then experience persecution. Calling them into a life of risk centered with Jesus, faith that costs him. And there is such a powerful reminder for us in Saul's life to remind ourselves that no one is too far from Jesus. Last week, I was talking, and one of the pieces that I was talking about was that we don't want to underestimate what God is already doing in the lives of people. And I want to just remind us as a community, we also don't want to underestimate what God can do in the lives of people. God is at work, and God is able to do unbelievable things. Now, it confronts some stuff in us, because we're like, yeah, no, I know that. I know that. But if we begin to think about the people in our lives, or people that we know, or people that we even know from afar, there are people that we put in the category of going, but not them. Everyone else, yes, I believe it, but, but not them. And Saul's story reminds us and the church that there is no one who is too far from Jesus. We have repeated stories in our biblical and historical accounts where we see this story continuing to remind ourselves. Here we discover that the sovereign, life-changing grace of God through Jesus can change everything. While Saul was still persecuting and setting out to destroy the church, Jesus intervenes. Not while he's a finished product or not while he came to the end of himself, but instead when he is on the way to do something, on the way to go after the church, Jesus stepped in and changed everything. Grace has the ability to redeem someone who seems irredeemable. And maybe in your mind you'll already go, I can think of some people. Don't say them out loud. I mean, say them out loud to God. Maybe not other people like, hey, that person, definitely not. But there are people in our lives, let's be honest, that we think they seem irredeemable. There are people we watch on TV, people we see from afar that we go, never them. And God's grace that is scandalous and transformative and changes everything reminds us no one is too far from him. And I recognize that even in saying that, that there are some of us that we feel like this. Maybe we follow Jesus or maybe we've never followed Jesus and we look at our life and go, okay, but if you actually knew me, if people actually knew me and all the stuff that I've struggled with or the things that I've done, I think they just go, you know what, I'm, God's love is great but not great enough for you. And, and I don't know what you've done I'm willing to bet you probably haven't pulled people out of their homes to have them murdered. And you hear a story like that and you just go, okay, in the grand scheme of things, all the things that I've done and all the things that I think make me unworthy of love, 
God continues to remind me through scripture that actually he loves us through those things and he sees us where we were and he goes, no, I have grace for you. Give your life to me. Surrender everything to me and experience the kind of grace that you could never earn on your own. It's a beautiful reminder for us and I think some of us in the room, we just need to be reminded of that again. I think for us, we go, okay, we're saved by grace through faith. And we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then as soon as we come to faith and we're like, I don't know, I feel like I don't deserve any of this, which is partially true. We don't deserve it. And yet God lavishes it on us. We get to live as sons and daughters of the creator of the entire universe. We experience grace that makes no sense based on who we are, what we've done. It only makes sense in Jesus. And for some of us, we need to continue to remind ourselves of that truth, to go, okay, the gospel is good news. It's the news that I actually am loved, beloved, transformed by his power, and that if I'll live my life in surrender to him, I can experience a level of freedom that the world only claims to offer. Does it cost you everything? Yeah, Do you lose everything that doesn't matter to gain everything that does? Absolutely. For some of us, I think we need to, again, surrender our life to Jesus and actually trust him. For some of us, I think we experienced this at one point. We knew who we were before. We experienced Jesus. Our life was changed, and and we went, wow, this is amazing. We told stories. Look what God has done, and then over time, It atrophied, and we thought about what God did once a long time ago, and maybe it just kind of set it up to the side. For some of us, what we've done is we go the other way, and we're like, you know what? I think I figured some of this out, and we start to be really critical of other people and judgmental in a comparison way. We're like, I'm so much better than that person. I can't believe the things that they were struggling with, and there are times that God's like, hey, um, you remember who you were like not that long ago? And you're like, no, I'm great now. I go to everything, do everything. I do all sorts of stuff. And he goes, yeah, but your heart is hard. And for some of us, I think we need to be reminded yet again of the scandalous grace and its power for other people. Because the reality is that I talk every single week and remind us that there are people around us that are positioned, that, that God has positioned on purpose. And I do want to use this as a moment to remind you that those people may not be the people you think. It may be the coworker that drives you nuts. It may be the kid in class that you're like, dude, please, just shut up, please. And God's like, ha, I'm gonna use you. It may be the person that you're like, actually, this person really wounded me. And maybe, just maybe, through God's redemptive grace and healing and forgiveness, that person could come to a saving knowledge of Jesus through the very person they wounded. I don't know. I do, however, know that the biblical pattern is that God often uses the people that do not make sense. And so what does it look like for us as a church community to actually live like that's true? It means that we can't view anyone as other. It means that instead that we see other people as children, desperate for their heavenly father, and it shapes how we view people. Now, I'm not suggesting that every time people are irritating to you, you just go naturally like, oh, they're the greatest person ever. But what if you began to pray for the people that drove you nuts? What if you began to pray for the people you perceive to be your enemy? What if you began to pray for the people that seem to be so far away from God? And what if through that, over a long period of time, through your obedience, they came to faith? Would it be worth it? What would it look like for us to have the kind of perspective? If God can save Saul, surely he can save our neighbor. And what does it look like for us not to have a passive view of that going, maybe at some point, but to go like Ananias to actually go, listen, I'm nervous, but I'll go if you want me to go. What if right now God is actually speaking to some of you in the room, and I think he is, and he's going, you know exactly who to talk to. You know exactly who to pray for. And you're like, I don't want to. Well, I'm here to tell you, stop it. 
Pay attention to what God is actually doing and be willing, willing to, to actually say yes where he is leading you. Maybe you struggle with some of that. You go, I don't know how I reconcile this because it, I don't know how it all works out. And part of the beauty of following Jesus is you spend your life watching God do unbelievable things that don't make sense as you trust him in areas that are difficult. We say as a church in our, our culture guide that stories are the scorecard of our success. For us, we see people and we see transformation and we go, this is why we do it. I've been having conversations with one of the overseers, George, and he was like, one of your Tyler-isms is you always say, that's the stuff. I want you to know that these kind of stories can be our reality and that's the stuff. The more that we live like this and we see God actually using us to see people transformed by the grace of God, the more and more it fires us up to go, who else you got? Who else is unexpected? And I just wonder more and more and more if God doesn't want to break our hearts for people that are difficult to love to remind us of how much he loves them. As a community, I want us to be the kind of community that is unwilling to think that anyone is too far from God's grace. I'm not suggesting that we start pushing people. I'm not suggesting that we start forcing things. I am suggesting to you that we should not underestimate what God is doing, and we should certainly not underestimate what God can do. I want to invite you for a moment to stand up. Would you close your eyes for a moment? And I want you to picture, I want you to picture maybe if, if someone came to your mind or you could ask God, but if someone came to your mind, the person that you imagine in your, in your life that seems so far from God, that seems to be in, in some ways irredeemable, in some ways closed off or really difficult to love. And, and I wanna ask God to bring that person to our mind God, help us to see the people that you've positioned around us that, like Saul, aren't easy to love. And God, I ask that you would, in this moment and in this week, give us an open door for that person specifically that comes to mind a scenario where you intersect us with their lives and maybe, just maybe, there's an opportunity for a step of obedience. God, give each of us the courage to step into whatever you want us to step into. God, help us to believe that the same grace that changed Saul can change the life of the people around us. Help us to demonstrate your love in an undeniable way. Help us to be courageous in praying for others. God, use us. We need you. God, we, we want you to be the one that works. Build our faith to take steps. God, have your way. Amen. I, I want you to know that that living like this demonstrates a substantial challenge for us. I'll just call the worship team up as I'm wrapping up. But this kind of life demonstrates a real challenge and at some level considering the cost. Because in order for us to do what God wants us to do, to see the people that seem to be irredeemable, to experience redemption through God, it will cost us. And at some level, I just, I want you to know that following the way of Jesus means surrendering your comfort. And so as we respond in worship, as we close even, as we move towards the closing, I just, I, I want to call us as a community to the kind of faith that sees people experience the grace of God that we can then in turn look at and go, it is real, changes everything. Look, if it could change this person, it could change your person. And we stir each other's faith up.
as we become more and more surrendered to the way of Jesus in our life. Let's worship in response.